Hello, everyone. This is Liam Torpy with Conservation Next Labs, and thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the first inaugural webinar in our Igniting Innovation webinar series. So we're doing this series to help you out as applicants or partners or anyone else who wants to engage with the challenge, uh, just to give you more information and also to get you excited about the initiative. And so we've got a few different webinars planned over the coming weeks, but today we are going to be talking about the fire crisis, the framing of the, the Fire Grand Challenge, um, what the main themes are, what innovations are eligible. And we have a really amazing panel today with experts from different parts of the fire sector. Uh, but before we get into a small presentation on the panel, I just wanna give a second to Caressa to introduce herself, our newest team member that we are extremely lucky to have with us with Fire Grand Challenge. Hi everyone, my name is Caressa Nguyen. I'm the new outreach and um, the out the new outreach lead um, for the challenge, and I'm very excited to meet all of you and uh, work with you on your applications. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. So we're going to get to hear more from Caressa during the panel, um, and also she is here and I'm here to to help you all. And so I'll be saying this during the presentation later on, but. Please reach out to us directly if you have any questions at all. Um, so we're we're here to support you. And once again, really lucky to have Chris on the team. So just to get started with the presentation here, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the challenge. Uh, so the Fire Grand Challenge and what it's about, um, what the themes are, and uh, to give you a little bit more information on how you can engage with the challenge. And so just to give a little bit of information, uh, the Fire Grand Challenge is an open innovation initiative um, brought to you by Conservation X Labs with support from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, USAID, ESRI, and Planet Labs. And then we have a whole coalition of partners here to help support you as well. And so the Fire Grand Challenge, the central theme is to try to find new solutions to destructive fire that bring together solutions from two different spheres of knowledge. So indigenous, rural, and place-based knowledge and cutting edge fire technology and innovation. And so we've seen within these two different spheres that there's a lot of new solutions, uh, but they haven't been uptaken at the speed and the rate necessary. And also there hasn't been enough interchange between these two spheres of knowledge. And so what we're trying to do is run a challenge over the next year and a half or so um, that will start with an open application period, which we are in right now. We just launched on August 8th, about a month ago, and we have about two and a half months left during this open application period. Where you're able to submit ideas for your innovation, you're able to apply to be part of the challenge, and then those applications are going to be evaluated by a third party panel of judges. And so we're going to have experts from all different backgrounds reviewing those applications and giving you advice on your ideas. Next, we're going to move into an evaluation and matchmaking period. And during this matchmaking period, the top six finalists, uh, we have funding for six finalists, but we're hoping to expand that cohort, um, are going to be matched with partner communities. And so there's going to be a matchmaking event where the technical applicants um, talk about their idea, what how they're imagining field testing it, what their goals are, and then the partner communities, um, which you can also reach out to apply as, as well, are gonna talk about their needs, their capacity, their eco-cultural goals for management. And then those partner communities and technical applicants are gonna be able to, to rank each other and form best fit matches. And then those six different innovator teams are gonna move into the exciting field testing and acceleration portion, where for nine months, we're gonna be connecting these teams with uh, technical experts, technical advice, we're going to be putting them through accelerator programming that's designed to help address any skills that you need to scale your innovation. And we're also going to be connecting you with scaling partners and potential follow-on funders. And then the most promising innovations, the most highly evaluated ones, will be winning uh, grand prizes at the end. And so to talk a little bit about the prizes, which is an exciting part, but once again, can't underestimate all the support that you're going to be getting during that accelerator period. Um, we have $295,000 for six finalist teams. Um, so each team will receive about $50,000 to participate in that field testing acceleration portion. Next, um, we have a lot of in-kind support and technical support. So you're going to be getting access to, to software and technical analysis and support from our partners at Esri and Planet and other partners and also our experts in-house. And then lastly, we have, we have $100,000 in grand prizes. And we're going to keep you updated as those numbers keep going up as more funders join the, join the coalition. So now let's talk a little bit about the fire crisis. And so if you're here today in this webinar, then I assume you may already know a little bit about it. Um, but, you know, there's maybe also some scientists, engineers, and other innovators here today that don't know as much about it. And so I'm going to leave most of that to the panelists. But just to give some numbers right off the bat, um, within the, the Western United States, there are 500 million acres that are at moderate to high risk of fire. 
about 46 million acres of that is in the wildland urban interface, which encompasses about 70,000 communities. And so we have tens of millions of people across the United States that are really fully threatened by fire. And so this threatens the drinking water of communities. 90% of the drinking water in the Western region of the US comes from national forests. It, it really threatens the safety, the property, the livelihoods of so many people as well. And so this is an issue that it's just, it's become clear that we can't ignore anymore. And so some of the critical issues that are driving this large scale crisis are the suppression trap that we are in um, where we have to suppress fires oftentimes because the conditions aren't available to allow for beneficial fire. So trying to escape that long history of suppression that we put ourselves in. Next is thinning and mechanical thinning to enable for beneficial fire down the line is often costly. It's, it's often infeasible on steep slopes and other areas that are inaccessible. And then next efforts are not incorporating and elevating indigenous, rural and local leadership and knowledge. And so there's a lot of deep local knowledge in communities across the country that can help with the management of land, but it's not being um, actually uptaken into the dominant fire management systems in a lot of cases. And so we've taken this information and we we took, or this is just a really brief snapshot. Once again, gonna leave a lot of it to the panel, but we've actually used this to develop the two main themes, the challenge. And so right now I'm just gonna take a few minutes to go through these themes and to talk about some of the areas where we see innovation is critically needed. So our first theme is scaling ecosystem stewardship. And this is one that we're very excited about. And so it's looking to incentivize and scale locally appropriate economically viable stewardship of the land and fire throughout the cycle. So the, the overarching theme of this challenge and of this theme here is to try to reestablish appropriate fire regimes. And so what can the innovations look like? And so I'm gonna give some, some broad kind of areas where innovation is needed and, and where you can submit innovations, but I'm not gonna tell you exact ones because we're gonna leave that work to you. Um, you know, you all have so many new ideas and that's what we're running the challenge for. So. Um, just to run through some of the, the points underneath the sub theme. Uh, first is pre-fire treatments, um, including beneficial fire, cultural and prescribed fire, mechanical and other treatments. So how can we support these treatments to be at the broader landscape scale across the region? And when I say the region, that includes the Western United States, Western Canada, and Mexico as well. So a broad swath of North America. Next is supporting stewardship economies. Um, so how can we create economic returns that feed back into that larger forest restoration? Um, and so how can we actually make near profitable incentives that actually enable large scale treatment? Because if it's too expensive, we can't do it. So how can we bring down some of those financial barriers? Next is post-fire restoration. Uh, and we partnered with American Forests on this. So how can we address growing restoration backlogs after the fire? And so just to dig in a little bit deeper to each of those topics, first off on pre-fire treatments, innovations can look like enabling more effective landscape scale management using fire. Um, so how can we support beneficial fire um, how can we maybe decrease the administrative or the permitting um, barriers that some of the beneficial fire and cultural burners face? Um, how can we actually um, kind of allow communities to, to see that it isn't a risk and actually enable it on their landscapes? Next, how can we advance more effective and cost-effective landscape management pre-fire? Um, how can we enhance restoration of areas degraded by fire exclusion um, through biomass re removal and utilization? And so once again, these are broad areas in the pre-fire space, but really how can we decrease the barriers to that forest treatment? And so within that second area, within the first theme, supporting stewardship economies that I mentioned, how can we create profitable opportunities for forest restoration? And so this is talking about how do you utilize that biomass on the land? How can you utilize some of those forest residuals that come from mechanical thinning or other treatments? And how can you use that to create marketable forest products? And so we're lucky to have one of our panelists here from the Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition, who's been working on this question for, for decades. And, and so how can we help bring new innovations into that space as well that support these long-term solutions that they've already been working on? And so some of this is actually creating new products like utilizing that biomass, bioenergy, mass timber, and others. But a lot of it is also kind of these more structural infrastructure elements. So how can we decrease the cost of processing these materials? How can we decrease the cost of transporting them, maybe by supporting local markets? Um, and how can we market these materials? And so it doesn't necessarily have to be some shiny new product. It can also be addressing these other gaps as well. And so next on that post-fire restoration theme um, and addressing those growing reforestation backlogs, um, how can we really restore and protect these local um, resources and local uh, ecocultural resources? And I think, one of the things about post-fire is one, you're dealing with the destruction, 
but you're also dealing with the potential opportunity to try to reestablish a more appropriate fire regime, um, reestablish appropriate community of uh, forests and plants. And so how can we first off mitigate the degradation of landscapes right after fires, including impacts from landslides, soil erosion, water pollution, um, which affects a lot of communities really gravely. But next, how can we enable long-term planning, monitoring, care for restoration efforts, how can we um, really have robust efforts that continue after that emergency designation ends and some of the funding runs out? So how can we continue these efforts in the long term to restore these areas and um, really make sure that that post-fire then becomes a more resilient pre-fire landscape as well? And next, how can we address, once again, some of these more structural logistical issues um, with the delivery of technology, delivery of seedlings, information or supplies to these sometimes remote areas? So. Once again, how can we bring down some of these costs? And so once again, sometimes it's not the most flashy solutions, but just kind of moving that, that profit incentive sometimes or what's financially viable is often really, really impactful across the entire region. So now talking about our second theme, which is um, our theme two, I've got that actually wrong up at the top, but it's synthesizing diverse knowledge. And so with that, it's promoting transparency and bringing together diverse sources of knowledge and data. And so once again, this is kind of, a restatement of the overall theme of the challenge, which is how can we synthesize knowledge from these two different spheres of knowledge that present really promising solutions. So place-based knowledge, including indigenous and rural knowledge, and also um, new technology within the fire tech space or other forms of innovation. And so how can we translate data into actionable information for all stages of the fire cycle? How can we promote information flows, two-way communication channels between communities and some of these dominant systems? How can we support situational awareness and coordination for proactive fire management? And so while we do have the stewardship theme, this can also include some of the more active uh, fire response areas as well, including union suppression. And so where suppression is appropriate, then that's also an area for potential innovations. And next, how can we understand and incorporate implications of future climate conditions into landscape stewardship practices? And so just to name a few more innovations, once again, I've got the title wrong there, but just imagine it says synthesizing diverse knowledge. Um, how can we inform actors on how to protect and or cultivate valued ecological and cultural resources during that restoration process before and after fires? How can we facilitate the incorporation of place-based knowledge in a mutually beneficial way that actually uplifts communities that gives them leadership roles? Um, a lot of the different government officials and nonprofit leaders and other people that we talked to during the development process have asked, how do you incorporate that local knowledge in a non-extractive way? And so that's one of the topics we're gonna to dig into a little bit in the panel, um, but that also that's a topic that we want you to dig into as innovators. And so how can communities use their knowledge? How can they engage with federal uh, land managers and other land managers and, and really make sure that we can manage those ecocultural values in a way that we haven't been doing in the past? And next, how can we facilitate the rediscovery and implementation of lost place-based knowledge um, for fire and fire-related ecosystem stewardship. So a lot of rural communities and tribal communities have lost some of those ties to how they traditionally manage these lands. And so how can we bring those back and give them the, the tools and resources they need to do that? And so there's a lot of different areas to take this theme. Um, and once again, as I said before, please reach out to me if you have an innovation idea that you're wondering, does this fit? Is this within the themes? And, and we could talk to you about that and workshop it. Next. What's eligible for innovation? So we talked about the two main themes, but what actually counts as innovation as well? And so for the purposes of this challenge, an innovation is a process, tool, approach, or digital solution that has a functional prototype that to be piloted. And so it doesn't have to be just a brand new technology. It could also be an updated process. It could be equipment, even old equipment that's used in a new way. Um, it could be a new practice that's been developed um, and you know, maybe adapted from another area as well. And so it's a broad idea of innovation, um, just like we're drawing from broad spheres of knowledge, but it could be information and communication technologies, um, it could be new ways of production or processing. And so once again, it doesn't have to be just a technology, but it does have to have these innovative new elements as part of it. And so another part of that as well is it does have to be ready to be field tested for that field testing acceleration portion that's gonna be starting in February of next year. So what is not an eligible innovation? Um, there's a lot of really important work going on out there that maybe isn't exactly well suited for this open innovation competition. Um, and so please reach out if you have questions about it, but if your solution is already established um, and already being fully developed on a broader scale, um, then we likely won't count it as an innovation. We're 
we're looking to scale innovations um, from TRL three onwards. So that do have that prototype ready, but aren't at full implementation already. Um, purely policy solutions. Once again, um, we're going to be connecting our, our innovators with policy making opportunities, trying to make sure that um, different governmental actors are aware of these new innovations that could use them. But if you're just proposing a policy proposal or solution, then, then that's not a great fit for the Open Innovation Challenge. Next is purely technical assistance or training or educational programs um, are an innovation for the purposes of this challenge. Next, purely scientific research projects. Now, a lot of the innovations are going to involve implementing scientific research or developing that scientific research uh, in and actually you know, seeing how it works on the ground. So that can count as well. If you're on the line, please talk to us about it. And then next is limited term projects. So we're looking to support efforts that can support communities in the long term, that can continue their work after the challenge and after the accelerator. And so uh, if your project is, is just for six months or nine months, um, then we won't be counting that as an eligible solution as well. So um, once again, please reach out if you have any questions about this. So now there are a couple of different ways to engage with the challenge. So we've been talking about all these different innovation ideas and there's a lot of broad area for new innovations. And so if you have that idea, um, then I'll direct you to the website later on to apply and fill out an application on our platform submittable. And uh, please also feel free to reach out to me about it, but you can apply as a technical applicant. So a technical applicant is filling out that full application on submittable they have an idea for a solution, so a new tool, a technology, or process. Now, let's say that you don't have necessarily an idea, um, but you are a local community with needs for new innovation ideas, with capacity to help with field testing, then you can join the challenge as a partner community. And so please go to the website as well, and you'll find that form to fill out um, to express your interest in participating as a partner community and potentially participating in that matchmaking process. And so these partner communities, they can be local organizations, local groups, um, they can be tribal or regional governments. Um, and so these communities are going to help with imbuing solutions with that local context and expertise, that place-based knowledge. They're going to help co-develop the ideas to make sure that they're effective on the ground and useful for communities and their other potential users. And they're also going to help execute the field testing acceleration plans. And so once again, after that matchmaking process, each team that will have a technical applicant and a partner community will receive that $50,000 and, and participate. And so if you have questions about whether you fit into the technical applicant area or the partner community area, please reach out. Um, if you are a community that has an idea for an innovation, then please apply as a technical applicant. Um, so you actually are able to, to please submit that idea um, with that innovation and um, you'll be going through that track. Uh, and so there's a, a couple of different ways to engage and we're really excited about that novel matchmaking process. And so now, how do you actually apply? I've kind of alluded to this in the past, but um, you can check out the Innovators Handbook on the website. This has a lot of the information I've been saying. It's got more background on the fire crisis, a lot more statistics, a lot of how we're viewing it. Um, it's got more information on eligibility, and also it's got the full evaluation criteria for how the third-party panel of judges is going to be evaluating those applications. And so there's that QR code um, down below. And so please scan that to download the handbook, or you can go to our website as well, which we have here, a QR code for our website. This website has even more information. And up at the top, I want to point you to that email, fire at conservationxlabs.org. Um, so that goes directly to me. It goes directly to Caressa and Gabby as well. Um, I can give you my personal email as well if you email me. Um, and so we can set up a meeting to talk to you. Um, we can talk through what you're thinking about for potential innovation. Um, the CXL team and I, we're not the judges. And so we are very excited to talk to you about your innovation, to give you advice on your application, um, to talk about what's a better fit or how you can tweak it. And so we're not by any means keeping you at arm's length. We're here to help you and we're on your side. So we're just here excited about your innovations and um, all the, the work that you'll be doing and uh, excited to help give you some resources and support to, to scale those ideas and make them a reality. And so this is all the presentation I have. Um, the most exciting part of this webinar is the panel, um, which we're getting to now. So. I'm going to stop sharing and uh, we can have our panelists come online. And so just to talk a little bit about the panel, I'm going to give each panelist an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, they uh, know their background better than me and they have so many accomplishments and so much so vivid of a background that it's easier for them to say it than me. But the panel we have today is looking at how do these themes relate to the current fire crisis? Um, what are the needs of tribal and rural communities? What is the role that fire tech plays? And 
we're really excited to, to dig into that with our experts today. And so um, I'll pass it to Shafali to start with the round of introductions. Thank you, Liam. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to hear more about the Firebrand Challenge. I feel like I've been steeped in it for over a year now, but I'm always learning new things. So thank you for that. I am Shefali Lakina. I am co-founder of Wonder Labs and founder of FireUp, which you'll hear more about, hopefully. Um, and we are into catalyzing all kinds of innovations, social, ecological, and technological. So I'm here to talk a bit about um, things that we've been thinking about and doing in the past past years, um, including the State of Firetech report, which I'll refer back to a couple of times when I talk uh, to you all today. Um, so I'll stop there and then look forward to uh, the Q&A. I can go next. Uh, hey, folks, I'm Cole Jensen. I'm a program manager with the Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition. Been there for a little over a year now, um, working a lot on wood utilization, uh, stewardship policy, things like the wildfire crisis strategy and peer learning there. Um, excited to chat with you all about rural community perspectives. Hi everyone, hope everyone's having a great day. Thanks Liam for having us. Um, my name is Saraya Hamidi. I am based in Southern California. I'm a Cherokee Nation citizen and I'm the indigenous partnerships manager at Blue Forest. I've been here for two years um, and Blue Forest, for anyone who doesn't know, is essentially a conservation non, excuse me, conservation finance nonprofit. Um, and we essentially bring people, finance and science together to restore and protect our forests, watersheds, ecosystems and communities. So really collaborative work often focused on the wildfire crisis and how we can support important restoration and wildfire risk reduction. Um, and yeah, just excited to, to be here today and talk to talk more about the challenge. Thank you so much. And, and once again, we're so lucky to have you here with us today. And so we got a great discussion today and I thought I'd kick it off with a, a question on fire tech. Um, with for Shafali. And so we're really, really lucky to have Shafali. Um, she's put the State of Fire Tech report uh, from Wonder Labs in the chat. So please check that out. Um, she is an expert and has done an overview of the fire tech field. And so um, she'll be very humble about it. But my first question for her is what areas of fire tech require the most attention and innovation right now? And which areas have the most activity already? Yeah, that's a great question. And I saw that you alluded to that in one of your slides as well. So thank you for that. Um, if I'm allowed to, and if we have time, I just want to step back a bit and talk a bit about innovation itself. And I'll come to your question as well, Liam, because I feel like we have a lot of assumptions about innovation, the process, the outcome, and who is an innovator. And I think that's kind of important to address today. And I feel like that holds the key to a lot of the discussion as well. So when I think about innovation, I'm thinking of a process that is really about the creation of a viable and improved offering, right? And there are many different ways to dice that, um, but let's be clear, innovation is not necessarily inventing something, right? It is um, something that doesn't have to be entirely new because let's face it, um, there's nothing truly very new in this world. Uh, there's always building on the ancestry of ideas. And that's something that I hope the panel will talk about today, right? We're always simply bringing adaptations of an idea or a practice to a new market or a new geography, right? So just keep that in mind as you're thinking about your innovation. Um, and then I feel like what, what you essentially need to do as an innovator is think about responsiveness, right? It's not about the creation of something new, as much as it is about being responsive um, to what you, your community or adjacent communities um, around you in the world are experiencing. So just being attentive about what is happening in the world and how am I bringing forth an improved way of thinking about something or doing something, right? Um, so don't be that innovator who goes around with this um, pre-baked solution looking for a problem um, because we see that a ton. Um, be the innovator who is being responsive to the need of the moment um, in the now and into the near future, right? Um, and so the main operating principle really has to be around co-creation, as Liam has already mentioned, it's co-development, co-production. Um, and that is from the get-go, 
And that is, I love the fact that that's built into how the Fire Grand Challenge has been articulated, how you're inviting applicants and technical partners along with community partners, right? Um, so that is that is going to be a really critical part of the creation principle. Um, and then think about, in terms of the viability, think about the outcomes that you're affecting, right? Um, what is the value that you are creating that will sustain, right? And perhaps lead to further innovations. Like that is literally what we do as innovators, right? And, and also that tag is earned. I don't give myself a tag as an innovator. That is earned because we did something that was innovative, that was recognized by a community of practices being innovative, right? Um, and so think of yourself not just as an individual innovating, um, but as an ecosystem, a culture, a network of innovation, right? To really co-creating and bringing that together. Um, now, in terms of answering uh, Liam's question, I just, I needed to preface because I feel like there's a lot of confusion about what is that process of innovation? Is everyone an innovator? Yes, but. <laughs> um, and so in terms of biotech, um, if you look at the state of the biotech report, um, we really have defined five kinds of trends that are materializing in biotech. Um, so you look at, you know, digitization, connectivity, mechanization, fintech, and materials. These are the five kind of broad trends that we're capturing over the past years in terms of what is biotech. Now, in mapping that against um, thinking about the different kinds of phases, so to speak, of uh, mitigation risk reduction, moving on to early detection response management, and then post bio recovery and restoration. When you map those technologies, how they're developing against those phases of a wildfire, you really begin to understand that actually, yes, we are oversubscribed when it comes to that middle part, that middle column, thinking about early response, early detection, and response management in general. We do have a lot of tech that is focused on that, which is not to say that we, we can't do with more, that is scalable and applicable, but just saying that is oversubscribed, both from the innovation community, funders, where money goes, and from the user community. What is currently a white space, not entirely blank, but definitely ripe for innovation, is around mitigation, and then the last column, which is post-fire and restoration, recovery and restoration activities. So I definitely encourage innovators um, to think about what are you bringing forth when it comes to those kinds of not just technologies, but innovations and in process in relationalities to places and institutions and cultures. Um, so open it up a bit uh, in terms of that thought process. I'd encourage you to do that. And definitely um, I'd like to talk a bit more about, you know, um, that whole white space a bit. I think Liam will get to it in, in a future question perhaps, but I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Shapali. And uh, I encourage any innovators watching, you know, use that rewind button to see all the great information that Shapali just said and, and unpack that. And uh, yeah, I think we were lucky to have Shapali participating in the, the design process of the challenge and helping come up with these themes and themes. And I think you can see how they match the activity of the fire tech space. And so now to take another step back, I'm going to throw it to uh, Caressa for the next question. Uh, so uh, my question is for Soraya. Could you speak to some of the main stewardship challenges facing tribal nations and communities and how the challenge can help to address aspects of these issues? Thanks so much. Um, I really liked how Shafali started, so maybe I'll just kick it off with also some background context on what innovation maybe means in the context of Indigenous communities. Um, so I think uh, as Indigenous peoples, we know that our our ancestors, our cultural knowledge holds all of the kind of solutions for some of these modern challenges. So um, we've been stewarding the land for thousands and thousands of years. Um, as I said, I'm Cherokee. So um, our traditional landscape is in the Southeast, a lot of forest lands, and we traditionally burned our land similar to tribes out here in the West. So um, these are traditional practices, um, but when federal policies kicked in that suppressed our ability to steward with fire and in other traditional ways, um, 
those those stewardship practices kind of in some cases got pushed to the side. Um, yes, there's many instances where tribes kind of continue to steward and endure um, despite all the suppression happening. Um, but overall, kind of we were living in this state where our knowledge was being suppressed. And so I think for indigenous communities, innovation doesn't, again, necessarily look like this is something brand new, but rather this is a return to our traditional ways. Um, and for tribes that have continued to implement these practices over the past, you know, 150 years of suppression, it's having that funding and accessibility to start testing that again in a more open way. So I think that's some context on maybe what innovation looks like for this challenge. Um, and so again, for us, I think the the this challenge presents not just that opportunity for innovation because we have that within our communities, um, but more so the opportunity to get resources to support practicing that. So um, for some context, there's certainly a myriad of challenges that tribal nations and communities face in stewarding their lands, whether that be policy challenges, whether that be jurisdictional challenges or workforce development challenges. Um, but I'm really excited to focus today specifically on funding um, because that's something that this challenge directly addresses. So first off, I'll state that in terms of funding, there simply just isn't enough of it. Um, in the 2023 assessment of Indian forests and forest management in the United States, the IFMAT team, it stands for Indian Forest Management Assessment Team, identified a $96 million funding gap between federal funding for tribal forest management and other federal agencies. So to put that in context, tribally managed lands received only 40 cents for every dollar of funding that national forest system lands receive. On top of that, like other land managers and stewards, tribes face more and frequent and larger wildfires than before, um, but we often don't have enough funding to meet those emergency needs. So um, one existing challenge is really just um, the more that we can increase and create parity with the amount of funding tribal forests are receiving, the healthier state that we can be in. Additionally, Federal funding sources often lack the flexibility um, needed and have heavy reporting requirements and restrictions for use. So little funding is often eligible for these innovative and experimental projects, um, such as to pilot a new technology or to test tried and true stewardship techniques in different settings. This leaves tribes with little room to pilot these solutions that we know work, but that often you need to test and have data all written down in order to, let's say, receive a future federal grant for. Um, so that's why a challenge like this for me is really exciting because the restrictions and reporting are far, far less. Um, and it's really giving communities and partners the room to explore and assess solutions in the way that is best for them, as opposed to what is best for a specific grant that has very specific requirements of, you know, what you need to do. This is really innovation first and community first. Thank you. Wow, thank you for illuminating that disparity. I think it's um, something that we, that many are, um, you know, subconsciously aware of, but to actually hear the figures. Um, thank you for that, Soraya. Yeah, thank you, Soraya. And I think as well, you know, it's a reality of this challenge that, you know, the funds given to the innovators, they're not the, the final end all be all, it's not enough, but we're hoping to connect all the applicants that move on to that final stage with follow-on funders, and also just hoping to shine a spotlight on their work as well to help make sure that they get the funding they, they already deserve. And so, I'm going to follow up with a question to, to Cole. And so part of RVCC's mission is to help rural communities, uh, including tribal communities, establish stewardship economies, um, and especially for communities that have faced hardships due to shifting market forces or changes in the industries. And so, Cole, can you tell us a little bit about some of the, the tenets of successful stewardship economies and um, maybe also talk a little bit about how innovators could try to incorporate those ideas into their solutions? Sure thing, yeah. Um, so the stewardship economy concept was developed by Nils Christofferson um, of Wallawa Resources. And uh, for deeper uh, dives into the concept, um, I'm posting a link in the chat to Wallawa Resources uh, page on it. Hopefully that'll be shared afterwards. Um, but yeah, the, the definition we're running with 
uh, for the stewardship economy is an economy shaped by the need and responsibility to manage for the health of both landscapes and communities. As Liam mentioned, a lot of rural communities, including tribal communities, are facing economic hardships after uh, things like the timber wars or general economic downturns and are being faced with choices uh, within our current economic systems of either moving towards amenity-based recreation economies that can disconnect um, their uh, management practices from the land and disconnect their income from stewardship, um, or uh, focus on business attraction and uh, generic um, economic development in the form of call centers or prisons or Walmarts or something that can replace the sorts of jobs that a, a mill or a coal mine might have provided before. Um, and the, the focus with the stewardship economy is really to couple the economic vitality of these communities to the health of the land. Um, so really focusing on beneficial practices like uh, active forest management, regenerative agriculture, rangeland restoration, or generally any sort of nature-based solution uh, that really provides ecosystem services as well as products. So um, the tenets of the successful stewardship economy examples uh, that we have, such as uh, Willow Resources and their uh, stewardship practices in Willow County, Oregon, are first and foremost focusing on land stewardship um, as the uh, economic driver. And in order to make that successful, you got to have things like value-added processing to multiply the jobs and revenue from stewardship and maintain the value of the working lands in order to hold off conversion. You've got to have a lot of education and training built in um, in order to capitalize on the local knowledge and skills and build local capacity um, in order to provide opportunities and keep kids in rural communities and prevent brain drain. Um, you've also got to have access to capital that's patient and appropriately scaled um, and pulling from a, a lot of diverse sources um, based on what's appropriate, whether it's a, a grant for a one-time boost or um, funds from a, a, a pension fund that's uh, slow and steady and will stick around. And you've also got to have a poly policy framework. Um, we're looking to build a, a multi-scale a uh, rural constituency that advocates for investments in rural capacity and land stewardship, um, really focusing on empowering rural agency in the policy process. And right right now, our policy context does not encourage stewardship economies in rural places or anywhere. Um, so we're, that's, that's really an essential piece. Um, and uh, a couple other important pieces are really, really anchoring um, the, the economy of a place in the existing human and natural resources capacity um, in those rural communities. It's, it's really, really difficult to come into a small rural community and say, we've got this awesome idea for this new innovation. And we know you don't have anyone here who knows about that, but we're going to, we're going to try to build this industry right here. Um, it, it is really, really helpful to figure out which places have some sort of connection to that if if you're going into a community that has a, a history with mills even if they don't have a, a mill up right there it's going to be a lot easier to jump start some wood utilization to support uh wildfire resilience treatments um and uh we're also really looking to reverse the kind of artificial opposition of rural community prosperity and ecosystem health that's been prevalent in uh, political, cultural, and economic thought. Um, there's there's a lot of ideas within our uh, general discourses about rural communities being harmful to the environment and uh, being uh, drivers of, of damage. Um, and that has been the case in certain contexts, uh, generally because of the way our economies have been shaped, but it is not inherent and does not need to be the case. Um, extractive industries will extract uh, 
from both the environment and from the communities uh, that are performing that extraction. Um, so that's that's really the the biggest impetus for this the stewardship economy approach. Um, and last piece uh, on on what a stewardship economy is um, is it, it is really essential to operate them within a connected framework. Um, a stewardship economy really only functions optimally once communities are brought together in networks. Uh, inter-community to share their resources and uh, strategize um, and also uh, connected in kind of inter-scale um, and inter-type networks bridging urban and rural gaps uh, both physically and ideologically um, and then lastly uh, just to hammer this point home I know I've said this a lot but bridging the the distant sectors of rural economic development and sustainable natural resources development. Um, do I have another minute or two to talk about how to integrate that into a strategy? Or am well, I, I think that kind of that kind of leads to my next question, actually, um, which is it's really interesting hearing about, you know, a lot of the, the, the deep management practices and paradigms from tribal communities and organizations developed over millennia. It's also interesting that there's these stewardship economy principles that have been developed over the last few decades and drawing in from economics as well. And so I guess my question is um, for, for all the panelists is with all these potential, you know, risks of, of working with communities and, and their needs not being met or them not being listened to, what, what advice do you have for innovators as they think about applying to the challenge, as they think about scaling their innovations, and as they think about working with communities in order to create solutions that really work? And so um, I'm going to start it off with Shafali and then Cole, I want to get back to you as well on uh, how we can really implement those stewardship principles. Yeah, great uh, three-part question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry, take any part of it and other panelists, feel free to jump in after. No, there's so much in there to unpack and I really like that three-part question. And I think we we certainly should put out more guidance for um, folks applying to the challenge around that whole piece. Um, I, I feel like we also need to kind of problematize the need for scaling every solution. You know, on the one hand, we're encouraging place-based, um, very um, kind of something that's co-developed in, in a community, with a community in a particular place that's applicable to that point in time uh, and that experience, that lived experience of being that community in that point in time. And then we talk about taking that model and scaling it and putting it everywhere else. and there's a tension there that I would want to call out and say, it's okay to say that we have a place-based innovation that doesn't necessarily have to be adapted and, and scaled to other places. Um, and I know that we get caught up in, in this because of the business models and the investment terms um, often, but I, I want to just say that it's okay to have a local business that answers a local need and stop there. It's okay. That's innovation at work and we need more of that, right? Um, and in terms of like how innovators can be thinking about as they apply to um, this bio grand challenge, um, I think it's about really firstly bringing um, your, your entire network of connections. Um, so I mentioned, you know, you're not a person, an innovator sitting in a lab somewhere thinking about this invention. You are a network, you are a community, tap into it, right? So think about what are some of the challenges that you've been hearing about and experiencing perhaps um, personally in your community? Um, how do you get local agencies, um, local nonprofits, core members engaged in thinking about um, some of the solutions to those problems and, and bring them along? So like, I, I know there was a question in the, the Q&A or the chat uh, where people are asking, can we bring, um, you know, can we suggest a community partner in our technical application? And I think you must, like if there are pre-existing relationships that you wanna bring forth, um, you absolutely must. And I think the team, um, the challenge administrators should do their best to, to match those folks because those are pre-existing relationships that we should put together so they can do this good work um, and continue at, right? 
um, I don't know if I answered everything in there, but I'll pause and wait for the other panelists to, to come in as well. Um, yeah, awesome points from Shpali. And I, I really like the idea of problematizing the, the scaling of every solution uh, in this place-based work. Um, and uh, I, the, the sorts of practices that I think maybe can be scaled rather than particular solutions are the idea of engaging in this place-based specific local way. Um, things like when you're going into a community to implement something, figuring out what their histories and connections to the land are, what uh, their industrial uh, proclivities are, and, and what, what skills exist in that community, um, and what their priorities are that you can align with. Um, some, some really important uh, things about making durable solutions in local communities, um, which uh, I think is uh, maybe left out sometimes these days is figuring out what markets in surrounding areas um, can be connected and how you can uh, support other stewardship focused businesses and be supported by them. Um, and those sorts of practice uh, practices, I think absolutely um, can and should be uh, scaled in ways that individual solutions or technologies can't. Um, great. So I can jump in. Um, appreciate the question. I think um, what I'd suggest for any non-tribal applicants to do um, when working with tribal communities, let's say in this case, would be to do a deep dive into best practices for partnership to make sure that tribal values and knowledge are respected and protected throughout the collaboration process. So Conservation X Labs refers applicants to various frameworks to guide ethical partnership, and that includes the CARE principles, which I employ in my own work and we employ at Blue Forest. And basically CARE is a set of principles to uphold indigenous data sovereignty. And it's published by researchers, including Stephanie Carroll from the University of Arizona. So essentially, CARE stands for collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. Um, and basically, it outlines how partners can uphold values to ensure that projects are collectively benefit benefiting an Indigenous community, that that community maintains that authority to control their data, both how it's collected and how it's used, and that certain responsibilities and ethics are upheld as well. So if you're interested in diving deeper into those principles, um, as well as taking a look at some other guides, there's there have been some really incredible guides um, published over the past year then I'd refer folks to the Fire Grand Challenge Innovators Handbook. And there's a section titled Data Security and Sovereignty, which has a lot of that information. So definitely encourage folks to head there. Thank you for that contribution. Um, I actually looked up the care principles myself and um, yeah, they're they're great to apply to um, all work. Uh, so I have a question for the panelists. Uh, what aspects of the challenge are you most excited about? Um, these can be potential impacts for communities and ecosystems, partnerships, collaborations that will come from the initiative um, or other facets of the challenge. And, and I'll add to that as well. That's a great question. And if there's any types of innovations that you're really excited might come out of the challenge as well, then you know, there's a lot of questions in there for you all to talk off. Uh, personally, I'm really excited to see innovations in the ways uh, that businesses and innovators connect to communities and uh, innovations in the ways folks find ways to keep value within communities and build up the community's capacity to keep it implementing long term. Um, it's it's not all about technology while we desperately need technological innovation and um, all that sort of thing. Uh, and then separately, um, really excited uh, to see what sorts of wood utilization solutions folks have uh, in order to provide a uh, an outlet for the material from uh, restoration and resilience work. 
I can jump in. Um, I'm really excited to see what comes out of the challenge related to innovations that support indigenous land stewards. So um, kind of taking those traditional stewardship methods and then uh, using either new tools or technology or practices to make it easier for stewards to implement that, um, potentially less invasive um, for, for uh, stewards to treat lands around cultural resources. Um, in cases like where you, you know, you, the Western way would be to have big machinery on the land, for example, like other technologies that can make sure that we're protecting cultural resources while implementing stewardship. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see kind of, uh, what new practices or tools can be used to, um, also, also, uh, ensure the continuation of traditional stewardship. Yeah, great points, Cole and Soraya. Um, I want to first just reflect on the Fire Grind Challenge itself as an innovation. You know, having um, put forth the Living with Fire Design Challenge at Wonder Labs in past years, I know that we need more such challenges and incubators and ways to think about the world. Um, and so I think I want to congratulate you guys first, you know, just the fact that you've pull this together and that you are inviting um, all of these innovations in. And I think just keeping at it, you know, we've had some one-off kind of engagements in the past, including our very own Living with Fire Design Challenge, which we ran for about three years, but I think everything has a, a, a cycle to it, but we must share lessons learned. We must share what worked, what we would do differently. Um, and make this a very open innovation process, um, even for Conservation X Labs. So I think that's the first point I would make about what I'm excited about is just uh, co-learning with you folks in terms of what your observations and learnings will be from this whole process. Um, and then for the innovators and the community partners, obviously, I think I'm most excited about the relationships that you're gonna form because um, we need to give innovation time. You know, these are not like, oh, okay, you got six months, go for it. This takes time. And so I am looking forward to just germinating those really important relationships um, through this challenge or perhaps solidifying in hopefully many cases, these relationships um, that, that pre-exist and are being brought on um, to this challenge. And, and I hope that those will continue to bear fruits uh, in terms of innovation, but also just um, relationality, just deeply investing in uh, places and people and communities. And we need a lot more of that. Um, in terms of areas, going back to fire tech, um, I do know, and this is, this is something that I emphasized in the 2023 State of Fire Tech report last year, is that we really do need more innovation outcomes in terms of mitigations. Um, this is something that I really wanna emphasize as you think about what innovations you wanna bring forth with community partners. Think about uh, the WUI communities, think about homes that need defensible space. Um, think about what mitigations we can do on the smoke management front, which is now the biggest killer um, you know, not ember direct flame attacks, but smoke itself is is going to be our biggest killer across the world, actually, not just the American West. So really thinking deeply about um, that is truly the innovation that we need in this place and time in this moment for our children. And, you know, just thinking about the future generations um, that we are working to secure their futures and their clean air and water. Um, what are those mitigations that we can bring forth in this moment? So I'd encourage innovators to really think about that in terms of biotech. Thank you so much, Polly. I think that's a, a lot of great information on A, the iterative nature of innovation and also on how we need collaboration within the space. And there was a question about super teams, whether people can form super teams or do early match and um, work with other innovators. We definitely encourage you to reach out to other innovators in the space. If you wanna combine your efforts, you can talk to us as well about that. Um, and so thank you panelists for, for that information. And for us, I believe there's a question from the audience. Um, yes, uh, so a question that was asked, well, um, I actually had some thoughts on what you all said and um, and I think this challenge is an excellent opportunity um, 
to uh, to develop uh, positive examples of co-production. Um, the, there are a lot of great people involved in this and um, I think that's what I'm most excited about. Uh, so the question is, what kinds of indigenous data are at risk? Um, does, Soraya, would you like to um, take that question? Um, I, something that we've talked about is um, how can innovator teams learn from and scale cultural fire and stewardship practices without appropriating knowledge? Um, and so um, that is definitely something sensitive. Um, some indigenous data that um, I've worked with my own tribe on is um, identifying culturally significant plants um, to incorporate into management plans. Um, that's sensitive data um, because a lot of, I'm based out of California, my tribe's in California, I'm a citizen of the Ion Band of Miwok Indians. Um, about 52% of California is public land, so it's open. Um, and on and within that, and so there are a lot of, um, you know, that's where our culturally significant materials are. And so uh, that's definitely something that a lot of indigenous peoples um, are working to protect. And I'll give, I'll pass it to Soraya. Yeah, thank you, Caressa. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a really strong example. Um, I think that um, maybe what non-tribal um, participants might not have the experience with this, there, there's this really significant history of exploitation of tribal information that can then be used to harm indigenous communities. So for example, as Caressa mentioned, like certain places where there's um, sacred plants or gathering sites, cultural resources that indigenous peoples use, even just knowledge of the locations of those um, can create issues where other people may come in if they know where that is and and take those resources that the, the tribal people are really dependent on. Um, there's a lot of cases of uh, looting of cultural sites. Um, so when that becomes public information, if there's a cultural site with artifacts or burial sites, there's been a lot of issues with looting and taking or destroying those materials. So um, for that reason, it's really important to keep knowledge um, really safe amongst uh, tribes and any trusted partners, um, and then to really be careful about what is shared and make sure that um, what is being shared is appropriate to be shared and doesn't fall under that bucket of, you know, private information. Thank you so much, Saray and Carissa. I think um, that's going to be interesting to see how different innovators work with tribal communities and rural communities to protect that knowledge and, and develop new means to, to scale up to what the communities want, um, the ecocultural practices to, to implement that knowledge while also protecting it. Um, and so we're getting towards the top of the hour, and um, I'd love to just give each panelist another minute or so to, to give some closing thoughts um, or final parting advice or anything like that. And uh, also just for everybody watching, um, we're gonna put the, the links in the follow-up email and in the chat. Um, there's been a lot of great resources shared by each of the panelists. So those will be coming your, your way as well. And so I'll kick it off back to the panelists. I'm happy to go. Um, I, I just wish you all the best. I think this is going to be super exciting. Um, you got armed with a lot of great knowledge today, but also from the innovators handbook that um, Conservation X Labs has put out there, which I think is super useful. And um, I think, you know, just as you get into it, um, look around, do your research, what kinds of startups, nonprofits, um, research agencies are out there that are able to provide those kinds of outcomes in terms of innovation and solutions. Um, I think there are some really great examples out there and they've all had different pathways to that success. And so that's interesting to dig into. There's no one formula to, the, to this, right? You, you can come at it from many different perspectives, many different journeys, some are faster, some are slower, and that's okay. So take your time. The most important thing is to do it right by, by you, be authentic to, your innovation process as you co-develop with a community um, and, and be very mindful of what impacts you're working towards. 
what are those outcome statements that you are trying to manifest? Focus on that. That's my advice. I'll jump in. My parting thoughts would be just if you're interested, definitely uh, connect with Liam or Caressa and email them. Um, the application process, from what I see, is not burdensome and participation is not burdensome. Um, so especially if you're capacity strapped or if you're just interested in learning more, I just really suggest you you reach out to the experts and they can provide a lot of support along the way. Uh, a few final thoughts from me. Uh, first, it, it's just been really cool to learn from Shafali and Sraya and Caressa on um, this panel and uh, reaching out to experts like them and um, figuring out how to outreach to the communities, whether tribal or non-tribal in rural spaces is essential. Um, there's there's a lot of nuance to connecting with the, the folks who are going to be implementing and doing the work. Um, and who are connected to the land where the work will happen. Um, and it's uh, that there's a lot of people who uh, have that expertise and uh, know a lot about the nuance who uh, are available to learn from. Some great closing thoughts. And um, once again, thank you all to the panelists. We have such great experts here. I'm just going to throw out a few plugs uh, of all the cool work the panelists are doing. Uh, first off with Shafali, uh, she's the founder of Fire Up. I'm not sure if you mentioned it in your answers, but it is a new platform with jobs in the forestry and fire space, um, with communities and areas to interact. So please check that out. Um, we're, we're looking at using that for the challenge or for the finalist cohort. So that's a really exciting area um, with Soraya and Blue Forest. Um, check out the work that they're doing, check out their social media and the stories that they tell on it. Um, and it seems like every single week they're coming out with a new forest resilience bond or other project or a cool new collaboration with the tribal community or other community. And so um, follow their work. Uh, and then also with Cole and the Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition, their annual meeting is coming up. And so if you're interested in the stewardship economy, if you're interested in their firework, um, all the cool work that the broader coalition is doing, register for that or check out their monthly stewardship economy calls. Um, there's a lot of different ways to engage. And so we're going to give the panelists an opportunity to, to send more links as a follow up. Um, so expect some stuff to come your way. But um, Thank you so much, everyone, for joining and um, for taking time out of your day for this. And we encourage you to apply and to reach out with any questions. So thank you all very much.